Hello everyone, Merry Christmas and uh, my name is Steve Merrer. Now I want to first off by saying thank you to Dave Hodgerin for putting tonight's uh, bits together. Um, unfortunately I apologise for not being here in person. Um, I've got mountains of work regarding some um, video production stuff that I'm doing at the moment so uh, unfortunately I wouldn't have been able to make it. Uh, however, I did say to Dave that after showing uh, the video tonight that I would actually do some type of kind of roundup of what has actually taken place because it is a bit of a long and twisted story. Well, first off, I have to do this kind of chronologically, so do please bear with me. First off, back maybe five, six years back, somebody contacted us called the Inkari Institute and asked us if we would be the official investigation team in regarding the discovery of the strange bodies in Peru. How did that come about? Well, the individuals had sought out the right people, tried to find uh, the right people to the right job. And we had been previously involved in something referred to as the Montauk Monster, washed up on Montauk Beach in the US. Yes, near that famous facility, the Montauk Proje Project. And uh, there was a, international press went all crazy on this, saying it was some type of strange, deformed creature that couldn't be identified. Um, and we conducted the investigation on that and turned out to be a skinless raccoon, which had been in the water for such a long time in the sea that it bloated and it lost its hair. And in fact, its unusual face features had almost lost um, and the bone structure made it look like it had a bit of a beak. So you can imagine you know, these original photographs that were taken by somebody who discovered this strange thing on this shore, um, thought it was something really strange. And of course the press went to town on it like they do. Anyway, we resolved that problem. That was easily sorted. It didn't take too long to, re um, to conclude what, what it actually was. On the back of that though, um, we've been uh, done a lot of work with the media, so I guess this is the reason why the Inkari Institute kind of picked out myself and my fellow researcher Barry Fitzgerald, who we've done a lot of work with over the years, um, got involved and he asked us to, to see if we could do the official investigation and we said, okay, yes, it's interesting, we'll, we'll take a look and then we'll get back to you and we did and uh, we decided, as you do, to head off to Peru. Um, and when we first got there, we were taken to a location out in the middle of nowhere, up on the mountains. So now Peru is a difficult place to, to visit if you're not used to it because of the climate. I mean, it's just so, it's so high in altitude there. You end up with altitude sickness. So every morning was a kind of a routine for us because we weren't used to it. It's getting up and vomiting, to be honest with you. And it was pretty difficult under those conditions to conduct a thorough investigation, but we plodded through. Um, I have to give it, let you know that Peru is a place where there's a lot of corruption and there's a, lot, a huge divide between those that are wealthy and those that are poor. And it is a problematic because there's a lot of crime that takes place because people just simply want to get more money or being able to survive from day to day. And that does involve ancient artifacts. I mean, Peru have been losing their heritage, sold on the black market for many, many years. And the government have tried their best to lock down on this, but it's a growing problem, as you can, as you can imagine. Digging up these bones and finding things is usually done by these grave robbers, which are referred to as waqueros. Now, we were taken to this location. It was all very sus, to be honest with you. Um, a car was sent for us, we, were, uh, we weren't allowed to know where we were going. We weren't allowed to do really any communication. The only time we, were, we, we really did manage to get any pieces of video footage was sneaky, very beans, very sneaky. And we eventually got to this warehouse and it looked like just an old run down warehouse, rubbish outside, a couple of dogs scrapping out on the front. It was just not a very nice place. But when you go in there, there was a section of this. It literally had been turned into some type of laboratory. It was very unusual. And uh, they were clearly must have been waqueros. I mean, they, they had guns. <laughs> they had guns. You can, can you imagine what, you know, what we were thinking, myself and Barry? God, you know, are we going to walk away from here? But do you know what? Despite what we were being told, um, we examined the bodies and we still, even at that point, 
we were a little unsure what was what. Uh, clearly identified some fakes, but we really, the, the main thing was what is Maria? This is a large body um, in, a, in a crouching position, uh, known to have three fingers and three toes. And she was the, the one we were really wanted to check out. We knew the other ones were a little bit dodgy right from the start. Dolls, in fact, in a sense of speaking. Um, and we were shown Maria eventually, and we, you know what, we looked through what, numerous different ones, right from the smallest to, to right up to Maria, who was unfortunately just kept in a cupboard and brought out in a, in a case and lifted out and put on in front of us. It was very poor conditions to be keeping things like that, especially in an area of, of the Cusco Mountains. And uh, we looked over the bodies and we realised that some of these things were very, very dodgy. Uh, and we said it as it is, even though that there were guys there with guns. I mean, do you know what? It is what it is at the end of the day. And we decided to say what we wanted to say. And we had to, you know, because we, we needed to be thorough. Anyway, um, what happened was that that wasn't the first time we went. The second time we went, we needed to get, gather samples. We had a laboratory that was working with us in Sri Lanka. And of course, Sri Lanka is an unusual place to visit as well. Uh, but it does give you the option to be able to ride an elephant. And that's an experience, I'll certainly tell you. Um, but nevertheless, we had to take another trip. And um, we had to find out for sure what was actually going on. Now, there are two videos that are out there. What you've probably seen tonight is the second video, which is more of a conclusion, a conclusive video that we did. Now, the first one, which is called um, Alien Mummies of Peru, I didn't title it, I'm very sorry. Um, and it's on, a way, it's on a Amazon and a number of other platforms, I believe. And you can watch that. And it is interesting. It shows you, you know, right from the beginning through the process of our investigation and, and the problems that we faced whilst we were there, including dealing with the press and other researchers, which seemingly were hyping things up and didn't quite add up. And when we were conducting our investigation, it didn't take us too long to realise that some of the doctors, when they say, I'm a doctor, we naturally think of you know, medical science or something like that. You know, but some of these guys were um, x-ray guys or dentists and, and stuff. It was just like, well, well, that's very vague and done purposely. What's going on here? And researchers involved, um, such as Jaime Massan, no names mentioned, um, who's got a past record of being involved in a new mode, dodgy things, um, was, hi was highly involved in this. And we, tr we wanted to make sure that, you know, when we realised what was going on is to put this to bed. And, uh, and we thought we had done, to be honest with you. Now, when you watch that first video, it will go through the process of our investigation up to that point in time. Now, there were samples and they were taken and they were analysed um, by our, our laboratory and these guys in, in Sri Lanka uh, work with the police forces and the kind of the FBI and that sort of thing um, so they knew exactly how to conduct these tests of course it's an expensive procedure and it's a lengthy it takes a long time as well and, you know these things don't happen overnight and the amount of international press that jumped on myself and by being the official investigators of this, um, we're demanding, we need to know, what, what do you know, what do you know? And we thought, okay, with so much demand, um, we will give out this information in the US. And we were invited to contact in the desert, myself and Barry, where we provided a thorough uh, presentation of what we knew up to that time, which is a very important. And I have to admit, there were some anomalies, there were some unusual things, and we didn't know what Maria, um, this largest body, really represented. Something didn't add up, but we didn't really know what, what was going on. Um, at that time, the laboratory was saying, well, there might be some very unusual things here, because they're trying to work out, working on the DNA and analysis, actually, what is this thing? Is it even human? Uh, and at that time, there was lots of question marks, and that's all we could deliver at the time. So, of course, if you watch that first documentary, it doesn't really conclude. You're left thinking this might actually be something quite profound with Maria at the end of this documentary. 
And that's only because of what we knew at that time. We were pressed to deliver information on an international basis. However, when we did a second trip and further tests were carried out and samples taken certain parts of bodies where we needed to really find out what was going on in the DNA. These areas were off limits you, you know, to everybody. Nobody was allowed to take samples from fingers and things like that. Um, it was like, oh, don't touch them and da-da-da-da-da. And I thought to myself, well, there's only one way to really conclude what Maria is, and that's to get these samples from these specific locations which have been requested by the laboratory to where to be taken from. That procedure took place and they went off to the laboratory and they conducted some tests and then bingo suddenly realized why they were having a problem why there were so many anomalies and that is because the problem in the dna though that there were there were contamination in there which they had to try and work work around because maria would, was handled by people without wearing gloves um, and messed about with and um, touched and prodded and you know, and he, there was DNA even from our touch, it just gets into it and it causes a big problem. But putting that aside, there were other issues. And we, why they re first initially registered, as you will see in that first um, documentary, if you get a chance to see it, that there were references to the DNA being unusual uh, at that time. And the reason being is because when we went back and cut, took these other samples, specific ones which would target this information as to you know what she really represented and i say bingo it means that we there was a discovery made that proved why those anomalies kept coming up in those results and that is because in maria's long finger which is longer than a human finger and only three of them of course is that a sample taken from here and a sample taken from here identified that these two bones were from two different sources. In fact, human bones, but two different humans. So the contaminant across them was a mix of multiple DNA from two or three even individuals. Uh, and that caused a massive, massive problem. Um, when that was discovered, we realized very quickly what was going on here, that Maria had been completely manipulated and various different human bones have been used to create those long fingers. And on further investigation, once we were armed with this knowledge, we, we could see where the thumb had been taken off, the rear, the rear finger had been taken off, the small finger, uh, the extension, um, how the eyes had been cored out, made them larger and filled up with di diatomaceous earth. Uh, the whole body is covered in white diatomaceous earth and you can get diatomaceous earth it's easy i mean in places in in peru you can just go and dig it up and you apply it like a like a like a, a filler like a cement over her. and it covers all those sins all those things that you think okay well it, there's a mark there it shows that obviously something's been cut off let's cover it over the diatomaceous earth and it was hiding loads and loads of problems evidence that she'd been manipulated. And there were numerous things in her that had been manipulated, the hands, the feet, the head, the eyes. Um, and clearly she was a real human being who was, I mean, the pose she sat in in this crouching position, fetal position, is the process of when burials take place, you know, in ancient times in Peru. Um, and they were placed into the ground in this position. Um, eventually, she was dug up by Wakeros and, uh, and manipulated and tried to turn into some type of alien creature. And of course, boom, the world went mad on it. You know, the whole world picked up on it, wanted answers. Um, and we decided at the end of this to go public. And it wasn't because of Maria, because there was others involved. Another real body was a small baby child called Wawita. And she also had three fingers and three toes. And people were naturally thinking the silliest sort of things like, oh, well, we, we too is a, the child of this Maria and therefore has the same three fingers, three toes and we're buried together. None of that, none of that is true. And when looking at it, you could see that even where Wita had been manipulated. 
and other samples were taken showing that child bones had been used. So we're carers, we're having people and themselves dig up these bones from graves and utilise them to manufacture these doll type creatures, uh, even bodies, and then cutting them up, make them different. There were two taxidermists involved. We found them and we knew where they were. They were in Palpa working on them. In fact, they were working on another male, another Maria, in fact, this time a male. And they were all already almost ready to release another one. We find out because we had guys on the ground working with us and they'd done some fantastic work for us. Um, but we wanted to try and find out what the hell is going on here. And it's a really dark and sinister story because Maria was on, for sale on the black market for a million dollars. The small fake doll ones, which are maybe about 12, 20, 24 to 36 inches long, there were several of them in various positions, which had been messed with. Um, and they were just generally creations. They were never anything real. Even then we're like up from 30 to 50 thousand dollars. You know, it was just crazy. And it was about all about money scam, money making. The Peruvian government were in search of these bodies. Now, myself and Barry knew where they were at that time. We met up with uh, somebody who worked at the government and they, we interviewed her and you'll see that in the first episode, the first documentary. Um, and was telling us how big a problem it is regarding these things happening and going on to the black market. It's very, very difficult to deal with. It happens a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of forgery and faking going on as well. Now, nine times out of ten, if you see something on the internet regarding, oh, well, it's from Peru, it's usually fake, to be honest with you. Very likely to be untrue. Uh, so there's a word of warning before you dip your hand into your pocket to think you're buying an ancient artefact. Um, you can go on to Lima Market and find them there get them pretty cheap actually. Uh, but nevertheless, one of the biggest problems for us is that we, we, we felt that we had a responsibility to let the government know. So we did share that information with the government, but then they were moving the bodies around from, from different locations. Um, an organisation known as Gaia um, had heard about this and we were also conducting some research and interviewing. This is when Jaime Massan got involved. And I was shocked to see that Maria, in a video, was on the top of a roof in Costco. And I know where that is, that roof is. Um, and it's not far, should we say, from the Inkari Institute. And she was open to the elements. I mean, this is an ancient body at the core of it. In a climate, which is humidity, it's just... She was starting to deteriorate quite quickly. And then on the, you can see them prodding and touching Maria on a rooftop in the open day. This, is, this should have been done in a laboratory under special little conditions. Nothing scientific was about this. And then they had these dodgy doctors that came in, which we also interviewed some of them during this first documentary um, uh, and to find out what they thought. And they were all very dodgy, to be honest with you. And um, we realised what was going on. It's a scam. In fact, be, there was a huge amount of hype at the time we were there. Uh, Jaime Massana uh, and his doctors and crew had managed to put an event together in Lima and was going out the to the national press. And we attended that and there were cameras all over the place from all these different countries filming it. And I think, isn't it all this hype, you know? And uh, he was heavily involved and in fact, he was even involved in saying that these smaller ones, 24 to 36 inches in length, were living creatures and stories of them being seen in a cave. And, in, and when we found them in this cave in Nazca, there didn't, was nothing in Nazca, it wasn't found in Nazca, um, that there was artifacts, uh, ancient artifacts, alien technology. Um, uh, these smaller ones were seen and running away under, in small tunnels. There was just all this crap, to be honest, crap that was being thrown out there. And the press were feeding on it like a frenzy. And of course, once we realised what was going on, we did decide to go public. And, uh, and when we, once myself and Barry went public, um, a huge amount of interest from the press came on us and uh, we told our story and what we thought what was what. And we had people contacting us 
researchers, those that are involved, screaming down the phone at us, you're going to ruin my career, da 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 da. And we, you know, this is very problematic for people like myself and Barry because we might be invited to events and we have to lecture alongside these people. It's crazy. What the hell is going on in this subject? We thought. But we decided to do the job. We were called in. What the Inkari Institute didn't realise is that they were thinking that we were going to support them. No. We decided to support the truth. <laughs> if you did want anything dodgy, they picked the wrong guys. Myself and Barry always are, are known for saying for what it is. Exactly. Um, and we don't hide anything. We put it straight out. If it's something dodgy, if it's something dodgy. If there's truth to it, then we say, okay, well, there's something unusual going on. It's always been the way with myself and Barry. They picked the wrong two guys because when we realised what was happening, um, they almost became, in a way, attacking the research and what we were doing. Uh, a purpose act. They'd even employ people to, to hound us, uh, to try and spread information about you know that everything that we were putting out was fake. Now, we also had death threats. You know, people said, "Don't ever come back to to, to uh, Peru, uh, otherwise you'll find yourself shot, dead, buried in the desert, and nobody will ever find you." I believe they were being truthful. These were people with, which were criminals and uh, grave robbers, and it goes up the chain. Surprisingly, when you do the research, it becomes very sinister because you realise some of these people might even be in association to people at high levels in the government that are getting backhanders from discoveries found out there in the deserts in, with, when digging up these ancient bodies and finding gold and artefacts and things like that. It's so, so bad. But what you've seen tonight is the second video and we didn't put that out for a long time. And the reason we weren't planning to put that out because we thought, well, if we put this out, then it attacks those other people that are involved in this research, people that we know. Um, and did we really want to cause a ruckus? We'd already known what was going on by now and we already put out our conclusion, but we never put out the video. And of course, what happened was we'd done our job, we'd walked, we'd thoroughly done our job over a period of, say, three years, a lot of work, a lot of expense, uh, which was uh, what we paid for ourselves, never earned a penny from this, uh, all done in the name of research. And what happened was we, like I say, we got threats and we were in no plans to go back to Peru, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, not until things calmed down and we put so much of the the right information out then it seemed it died a death and um, the stories faded away knowing that the government were still trying to find these bodies we heard that they eventually um, they, they, they relinquished them to the government um, well Maria and Marita at least the other ones are dolls and the government knew that uh, but the general public was still being filled around the world and uh, they moved Maria to a museum in, in Ica, where she is, I believe, today. Thank heavens she's not messed about with, because then when we used to go and see her the second time, it was like she'd had a makeover. <laughs> I mean, she was deteriorating, so they, they had to do a makeover with her again, make her look good for the other people coming out and taking photographs and filming, especially news channels and reporters. Um, but it was n no surprise to me that they were all trying to gain money. And when they realised that things weren't going in their favour regarding myself and Barry, who they'd had invited to be the official investigators of this, they turned on us. And uh, on one of the visits to Peru, going back there, to the Inkari Institute, um, we were met with a dilemma. And this is when we realised that they were on to us, that we weren't going to be saying anything in favour of this. And we were blackmailed. And basically what they had, they said, look, you know, we want a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars. Otherwise, you're not going to see the bodies. And then we thought, well, that's just surprising because we're supposed to be working to help you. You asked us to get involved. Um, and now, we, after all this expenditure on flights and hotels and stuff, and we get there uh, in uh, Cusco, Peru, at the Inkari Institute, you say, oh, sorry, you can't go any further unless you pay us a thousand dollars. 
Now, this was to Thierry Hamming. Thierry Hamming, who runs the Inquiry Institute, who you'll see him in the, uh, in the media regarding the Mexican hearings about these mysterious alleged bodies, um, that he's an archaeologist. He's French. And we did some research and we contacted people in France. We've got people on the ground there as well. And some of the specialists said that, no, he's not an archaeologist. He never qualifies as an archaeologist. In fact, um, he'd been disgraced on numerous occasions. Uh, so then he fled to Peru. And what did he do? Well, he married a girl who was uh, the daughter of the chief of police. He also worked at the, he was retired and worked at the Inkari Institute. See where I'm going with this? It's all kind of in, in house. And between them, then concocted an idea to get a thousand pounds out of us, or a thousand dollars. Under the circumstances, we should have probably just walked away there. Um, but we knew that there was more to this story. And having to go through all this and all that expenditure and all that messing about and travel and hotels, we thought, okay, let's give them the thousand dollars and we carried on and gave us access again to the bodies and more information. Uh, but we thought, okay, well, we'll still carry on and accumulate our information together because we're going to deliver another blow to them. And we did. Um, and again, there came the attacks and the threats and all this, that and the other. And of course, we just totally ignore them. We publicised two of these stories in Phenomena magazine. You can get that from phenomenamagazine.co.uk. Um, go into archive and you'll see that there are two, look at the front covers, and there's two um, magazines that covers these stories. Our first, linking to the first documentary, and our second, in regarding conclusion. And uh, every, we, what, we delivered it so well, again, it kind of died a death. And that went on for quite some time, and it, it was quiet. But then, more recently, it crept up again, because they just will not stop trying to cheat the public into thinking these are real, maybe even be able to cheat the people or get them to believe that they're worth buying on the black market for a tremendous amount of money. And yes, we were already aware at that time that some of these smaller ones had already been sold. One went off to Japan at a tremendous price. These were working, they were being sold illegally on the black market and there were nothing of the sort of what they were said to be. And now they've got all these, you know, these recent Mexican hearings, not one, but two, you know, it's just crazy. They're just starting it all up again. It never seems to end. But you know what? We can't keep returning to this, guys, as you can well imagine. We've got all the research to do and other, other things to do around the world. We can't just keep doing, providing information over and over again because people will believe what they want to believe at the end of the day. In fact, even when we provided detailed um, information showing the evidence against these things, people have even said, believe it or not, no, 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 they're alien. People will believe what they want at the end of the day, and we can't sit there doing this day in, day out. We've got other things to do. We came in, did our job, we walk away, we're on something else. But because there was so much impact of this first Mexican hearing and the press reaching out and people reaching out asking questions, we ended up in discussions, and myself and Barry decided, okay, it is now time to release the second episode. And we did. And this is probably the one you've seen tonight. Now, as you can imagine, you know, it's, it was a difficult investigation, probably the most difficult investigation uh, myself and Barry has ever been involved in. Because when you realise that there are people that go out and dig up remains, and imagine going to a family grave, um, a cemetery, to visit, you know, a relative has passed away and you get there and you're horrified to find out that they've been, there's a hole there and they've been exhumed and taken away. You know, can you imagine that? But what if it's even children? You know, it's happening with ch children, bodies. And we actually even investigated and got, because we had people on the ground in Peru helping us, um, the Wakeros were paying people to go out there who were very poor to go out there and collect samples and dig these things up. And we managed to get hold of one of these guys and interviewed him and he, he whistled blown exactly what was going on. But these guys are dangerous, these Wakeros, and you know, they, they've been involved in numerous things, including allegedly um, people have gone missing or been shot and so on and so forth. So you don't mess about with these guys. 
And um, we'd, like I say, we'd uh, had our death threats, myself and Barry. So, um, yeah, it's very, very difficult. But what happened then was um, we decided to put this second documentary out, and this is the one you've seen. And you can imagine trying to deal with this and finding the horrific news about children being dug up and cut apart and messed with and added to other bodies and manipulated. And for what? For greed, for money, and the loss of the heritage regarding artifacts for Peru. It's just terrible. And having to work at that, and it was very upsetting. And it is still very upsetting. I can't even describe how I felt at that time during that documentary. It was very challenging. Uh, and you can see in that episode that you probably did that second documentary that you've just watched, which we, we released over YouTube, that, um, you know, it was, it was hard and it was upsetting at times. And I just pleaded to people to please, you know, put the story straight. Don't let the media run away with it. Let the media know. You know because it's only because of the media interest and the huge media interest with all these papers saying, oh, we're, they're aliens and this, that and the other, that people are daft enough on the black market to buy them. They're thinking, oh, there's something special about them. I'm going to buy them on the black market. A bit like the dark web, I suppose, trying to buy something which is a bit dodgy. Uh, and I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> Nevertheless, though, um, we were hounded, so we released this second documentary, saying it for what it was. Now, I've got a few slides that I'm going to be showing you in regarding some of the conclusions that were met, and these are just very easy to be identified. And this is what we, um, part only a sample, a small sample part from the reports that we had. Um, this is, um, let me show you a couple of slides here. So this was the first, uh, the first two, you know, 24 to 36 inches bodies, um, they were clearly fake. <laughs> now, there have been even videos created by people that Jaime Massan knew of these things animated and walking around to demonstrate how they must have moved. Well, these guys didn't even have ball joints. They couldn't have even moved. <laughs> There's nothing living about these creatures. The dolls uh, are made up of animal bones and children bones and all sorts of different things. Um, I made a, probably a taxidermist or something like that. And he'd use real skin across them, animal skin. Um, hairs from, you know, um, the skin from um, dogs, Peruvian dogs. Uh, and when you easily found in certain places and used to manufacture these, maybe a taxidermist put these together, I believe so. You can see me in my puzzled face there. I'm thinking, what the hell have I got myself into? <laughs> and you can see this, the skin marks. Now, they, they tried to even, I didn't even saw newspapers that were saying, this is reptilian skin. It's another twist in the story to say, you know, alien reptilian beings of some sort that live underground. I mean, you know, um, you have to look at these and say, okay, fair enough, I get where you're going at. But this isn't, this is it. it's dog skin. That patterning effect that you can see isn't the actual skin at all. It's, uh, they had a wrapping around it, which was um, uh, like a blanket. And um, that, when they pulled it off, that's how it left the effect across the diamaceous earth applied to the body. The first one that they brought out was this little chap. He was about a foot long. And uh, first thing I shouted out, and Barry was like, what the hell, uh, is when I was taken in there was, um, well, this is a fish head. There's a head of a fish on the top of this body. What's going on? And Barry's like looking at me going, oh my God, you know, what are, what are we getting ourselves into here? Um, and it was, it clearly was. Other things that were shown, you know, um, hands, very large three-fingered hands, with some of them had discs on, on them, some of them didn't. Some of them were a complete mix match of various different bones. Uh, this is the one, the three-fingered the three -fingered long, it's about this big, this hand, uh, made up of real human bones, manufactured, but this copperish brass disc on the surface of this uh, hand was made from the same material as these copper jars, which you also can find in Peru. Um, and it's as if it's just been applied to the actual hand. Nothing unusual there. And you can see again here, the same sort of effect. 
Then his poor little Wiwita, who was a real body, who was manipulated and cut up and manufactured, and it was heartbreaking to realise what was going on. Uh, and of course, Maria. Um, there was Maria and Wiwita, which were the only two living uh, creatures. Now this beam, this is Wiwita, hair sample, which we can take a sample of there, and cloth sample on the back there. Um, and uh, these scientists were instructed to take uh, these samples. We had a full chain of custody, by the way, and you have to have that to make sure that the samples that are taken are the samples that reach the laboratory and are analysed in that order. And you've got to do that. You've got to be very, very thorough. Uh, this is Wawita, as you can see. Uh, sorry, no, this is Maria. Uh, three long fingers, three long toes, uh, completely manipulated human body that was dug up from the ground. And she's about 2,000 years old, to be honest with you. You see their samples which were taken. Skin on the hand sample, skin on the foot sample, powder sample, deep bone tissue samples. Okay. And this is where wheat is foot, and we can see the where the actual toes have been cut off, leaving only three toes behind, which is a shame. Uh, but the evidence was there. And these were also fake. There were plenty of these small 24 to 36 inch bodies. Um, and they were making them regularly. This is another three that popped up on the scene. Uh, I called them, nicknamed them Huey, Dewey and Louie. <laughs> Quick off the, uh, off the manufacturing table into being sold on the black market. Um, but when you do the research, and people have been involved in this as well, so we're not the only ones out there, that you find that, well, ball joints aren't used. One of the bones is turned the wrong way round. You know, it's just they're completely manufactured and trying to be passed off as real living creatures at some time. And like I say, these things are just like dolls. They've not got no ball joints, they've got no uh, ways of eating, breathing, so on and so forth. It just could not ever have been a living creature. We also saw them, one of them, which apparently Sidney said, and according to the news, had carrying, uh, was carrying eggs inside this reptilian, underground alien being, which is about 24 to 36 inches tall, I was somehow carrying eggs inside. Well, these aren't eggs. I mean, God knows what they are. They could be M&Ms, all I know. Um, but they're definitely not eggs. And there's a slight little bulge there where they, they've placed them inside on the body. Now, when x-raying eggs, I mean, you can just see at the bottom here, Eggs are, you know, on an x-ray, this is a reptilian as well, this is a, a, a tortoise. Um, you can see the eggs are transparent. When x-raying eggs, eggs are transparent. And they always tend to be roughly the same size and shape. Not like this, which are like different sizes, different round ones, oval, oval ones. But you, this, this is, maybe the little stones or something, but uh, certainly they're not eggs. So we've, we've proven that. Um, this is an animation to the right hand side that, you know, that Jaime Massan was involved with with people showing out how these things moved as if they were a living being, promote that they were a living. Didn't have any ball joints. Look, look at this creature here, look at the left, where's its ball joint? Oh God, it has it. A poor thing could have never even moved. Yeah, terrible. Um, and there was quite a few skulls of these small ones as well. Um, again, completely manufactured and we realized what they actually were they were the heads of of dogs on lemurs they used two different uh, sorry dogs and llamas um or pal uh, alpacas should we say those are the right word alpacas and there are plenty of them in peru um and dogs and in fact these skulls were manipulated of these animals to make them into these as we can see and uh, you can see obviously these Peruvian dogs were plentiful and uh, they used, dug them up because some of them were buried. Some of them can be found out in the desert, um, which have died and opened to the elements for long periods of time. And a manipulator taking the skull and, you know, shave it down, manipulate it. The evidence to the right hand side shows how they did it and the, and the skull part of the, these dogs, which were being used to create these things. We knew exactly what was happening. 
the fake fingers. These large hands with these long fingers made from different bones. That's some bones even upside down, some, some are not even joining together. These were never real. And if people say, well, look, you've even got a fingernail or a thumb, uh, a thumbprint or whatever. Well, yeah, because you've cut it off a corpse and you've stuck it on the end. So you're kind of going, oh, look, it's got a fingerprint. Oh, look, it's got a nail. Well, yeah, of course it was. Well, it's never a living thing. These were manufactured. Just look at the craziness here on this, <laughs> these bones that are supposed to represent a hand. You know, this no way. I met up with Brian Forster when I was uh, over in, um, oh, where was I, Bolivia? I can't remember. And um, we had a heated discussion about this, uh, and we were both very disappointed in finding that the evidence points that these are fake. Brian knew it, I knew it, we were both on the same page, yet we were living at that time in a world of hype and stories surrounding these things. It was crazy. In fact, this one that you can see on the right hand side is one that Barry made. Yes, simple little thing like this could be passed off. Yeah, uh, and Barry had made this himself. It's on his wall, it's on his wall at home. You know, mem remembering the fact that obviously, you know, these things um, and after doing the journey of investigation were all fake. This was the first one that was presented to us. Had a fish head, 12 inches long. Dream tried to be passed off as a real type of living thing, uh, preposterous. Uh, you can see that it is, a, it is in fact, through the skeletal x-rays, a fish head. It's been stuck on this body. N missing ball joints, no way things this should have been able to move. And that's because it's a small doll, it's as simple as that. Um, we had a lot of help from um, archaeologist Mark Holley, who's a good friend of ours and uh, he's an exceptional researcher and expert, I'd say, in the study of ancient bones in, in archaeology. And he realised very quickly what these were and the, what, how these bones were animals or other things that had been used to make these doll-shaped bodies and heads. The Sri Lanka team, though, were very successful in identifying eventually what the problem was, and that was because there was mixed DNA within these bodies, and we put that information out in, a doc in this documentary, and we, we let people know. Now, we have said our last piece on this about maybe three or four months ago. We made a statement across all internet, all social media, that look guys, we've had enough of this. They are always gonna continue because there's money to be made in it and there are daft people out there who are silly enough to buy them on the black market for a stupid price. And what we said was, we've come to the end. This is our last statement. This is the second conclusive video. Take it as you see it. If you've got questions, don't bother. We're moving on. We've had our fill of this. And we have, to be honest with you. Uh, and even now, I still get people contact me saying, Steve, would you come on a radio or podcast or TV thing and, and explain about, no, I won't. I will not do it anymore. I'm saying the same old thing. I'm fighting the same old fight against people which are really want to believe that these things are real and authentic. The problem is, you know, that Sometimes the worst stuff gets the biggest publicity and anybody will tell you as a researcher in this game, even probably Dave would have probably agreed with me on this. And the Mexican hearings is certainly one of them, you know, not just one, but two now. Promoting that these things are real. We've got all these doctors that says it's real. You know, if you watch this, after watching this second video, you'll realise we didn't mess about with just doctors. We go straight to the top because there's only one professional that can look at bones and are trained to identify them. And they are professors of anthropology. And we went straight to um, the professors of anthropology of um, Paris University, Moscow State University, and even Lima University. And we got not one, not two, but three conclusions there are all matched. These things are all fake. Even, the, even out of desperation, um, one of these so-called doctors working with Jaime Massan and the team promoting these things 
reached out to one of these universities, uh, it was the Moscow State University. They realised what was happening and contacted me back. And he completely ignored them from that point, wouldn't communicate with them, because he realised Moscow State University were onto him. We have the evidence of that, we interviewed them, we talked with them. Um, you know, it's always difficult when there's language barriers, you know, and a lot of information is lost, you know, because you don't speak Russian or you don't speak French and so on and so forth, or you don't know a form of contact or what's been going on across uh, in, in other countries uh, surrounding these uh, discoveries. Bottom line is, when you, you, you put the effort in, you realise huh, there's so much evidence to point out these are not authentic. You don't have to just take my, uh, my and Barry's word for this, you can look at the evidence that they've provided. And yes, it is there, and it is on the, even on the internet, but unfortunately, like I say, language barriers do come into this. Um, and it's difficult to even read what people are writing about when it's in Russian. Uh, but nevertheless, though, we broke through those barriers and managed to get um, a cooperation between all these different university uh, departments and the professors. So, at this time, it's still being pushed out, it, you know, it's uh, the Mexican hearings and those things will probably continue and they will continue and keep doing this, um, which gives them the option of being able to sell these on a black market and they'll just keep making more, you know, more of them will come. But the problem is, is that, you know, the big, big problem is the media, biggest of all problems, is because the media cause so much hype around this and come up with stupid things like saying alien bodies discovered and all that sort of thing, that it convinces people who are willing enough and daft enough to pay a lot of money on the black market for them, and it's a production, and it will just keep on going on and on. Unfortunately, there are people out there like Thierry Hamming um, and numerous other people at the Incari Institute, including Wakeros, and those that are collecting these items on behalf of Wakeros, um, and Jaime Massan, that could benefit deeply from this, you know, certainly financially. So uh, that is the situation. And like I say, you know, it's going to go on and it won't be the first time other things like this have been popped up now and again in other countries. Um, but it's time that people realise exactly what's going on over there. And um, like I say, unfortunately, none of it is true. Um, so I want to thank uh, Dave um, for um, inviting me to do this video for him on a roundup of uh, after the video uh, of the documentary that you've seen the second part the first part is available on Amazon and other platforms called Alien Mummies of Peru we didn't create the title unfortunately um, but it is all legitimate the information in there of the first part of our investigation so we realized what was going on um, and uh, also that you can get those two magazines available uh, to download or read online at, at uh, phenomenamagazine.co.uk and go into the archive and you can download those those two you just look at the front covers it shows them on there the uh, these strange beings uh, allegedly <laughs> and um, you can read about the reports that uh, we've put out on them uh, so a big thank you uh, for putting up with me for the quite a lengthy um, uh, rundown of uh, what you've seen tonight uh, and a big thank you to Dave and I wish you all a Merry Christmas and I shall hopefully see you uh, in 2024 sometime so thank you again <laughs>